comienzo a la solemne sesión oficial de recepción del excelentísimo señor doctor Alvin Roth como académico correspondiente para Estados Unidos. En el libro de actas de esta Real Corporación, correspondiente a las Juntas Generales Plenarias de Académicos de Número, figura en fecha de 30 de marzo de 2017 el acuerdo válido, entre otros, de nombrar académico correspondiente para Estados Unidos al excelentísimo señor don Alvin Roth, tras seguir todos los requisitos estatutarios y reglamentarios. ¿Ratificáis vuestra aceptación de ingreso en la Academia? Sí. ¿Prometéis, por Dios y vuestro honor, guardar su estatuto y trabajar por ella, defendiéndola y aportando vuestra cooperación? En nombre de la Real Academia de Ciencias Económicas y Financieras, confirmamos solemnemente vuestro nombramiento de académico correspondiente para Estados Unidos. And I want to talk to you today a little bit about markets in general, and then some about kidney exchange in particular, because Spain is, is a leader in, in transplantation. And when I began my work on kidney exchange, one of the first talks that I gave in 2004 was here at the Barcelona Clinic. So I'm glad to be back. So in the United States, this morning there are about 100,000 people waiting for a transplant. But In all of last year, we only did 12,000 transplants from deceased donors, okay? Uh, and the situation is similar in Europe. So the, the top line is the number of people waiting for transplants. The red line is the number of deceased donor transplants, transplants from dead people. But kidneys are a little bit special because healthy people have two kidneys and can remain healthy with one. So it's possible to get a, a kidney from a living donor, and those blue bars at the bottom are the living donors in Europe. So, so there are many more people who need kidneys than there are kidneys, but the, the one source of kidneys is from living donors. If you love someone who is dying of kidney failure, you might be able to save their life by giving them a kidney. And here you see the kidneys transplanted per million population around the world. And you see that Spain is right at the top of deceased donation. Uh, per million population. So Spain is, is you know, w w admired around the, the world for the success in getting deceased donor transplants. Turns out it's a little complicated to do a kidney exchange because you can't give valuable consideration. So that means you can't write a contract. So here I am, this picture is, is taken around 2006 in Cincinnati. I'm the man in the yellow gown and I'm keeping my hands to myself so that no one hands me anything. And on the left, in the bucket, is a kidney. And behind me in that picture, not in the picture on the right, but behind me in the picture on the left, just steps away is another operating room. And the donor who has given that kidney has, is, is just steps away. The kidney has been carried into this picture and, and is being prepared. And it's being transplanted into the man on the right in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, at the same time, the same operation was going on in a, in a nearby city, Toledo, Ohio. And when I say at the same time, what I mean is the, the senior surgeon in the room, the man in the, in the tiger skin cap, a man named Steve Woodle, in the operating room, after the patients had been prepared and had been anesthetized and the initial incisions had been made, from the operating room, he got on his cell phone and he called Mike Reese in Toledo, the other surgeon, and he said, we are ready, are you ready? And when he heard that they were ready, the operations proceeded, proceeded. And the reason they do these operations at the same time is to make sure that no one, no pair gives a kidney and then fails to get a kidney. 
right? So what happened is the, the, the donor here who traveled to Cincinnati is from Toledo, Ohio, and her patient in Toledo is getting the kidney of the Cincinnati donor at the same time. But what that means is to do even a, the simplest exchange between two pairs, you need four operating rooms, four surgical teams. So, they, so it can be hard to arrange, and that, mean, that would put a limit on how many transplants we could get. But sometime in the United States, we have non-directed donors. Someone comes forward who wishes to give a kidney, but doesn't care to whom he gives it. And in that case, there's an opportunity to do these transplants in a chain that does not have to be simultaneous, because every patient donor pair can receive a kidney before they give one, so no one ever gives a kidney and then doesn't get one, except for the, the first non-directed donor. And when you do that, you can have a long chain. This chain at the time, in 2012, was the longest that had been done in the United States. And it has 60 people in the picture, 30 donors and 30 transplants. And of course, you couldn't do 60 operations at the same time. That's too many operating rooms and too many surgical teams. But this is generally a problem of um, of marketplaces that have to be solved in market design, how to deal with congestion, how to make it possible to look at all the transactions that you want to look at. And so chains have proved to be quite important in, in kidney exchange. But in Spain, the first kidney exchange was done in 2009. And by 2014, there was a, a celebration of the 100th uh, kidney exchange transplant here in Spain. And in 2015, if I understand correctly, in 2015 alone, another 125 were done. So here in Spain also, kidney exchange is becoming an increasingly standard way to, to do uh, kidney transplantation. And that, that's true here in Spain, which is the, the country that is the most successful in the world in getting deceased donation. Even when you are the most successful in the world, there are not enough deceased donor organs. So, uh, so there's a waiting list in, in Spain as well as there is everywhere else. And, the, and waiting to receive a kidney is a long and a dangerous process. In the United States, thousands of people die each year while waiting. So, so it's important to, uh, to increase the supply of, of kidneys. When I talk about markets generally, I talk about making the market thick. Right? So the idea here is if we can find more people who want to exchange kidneys, we can mutually benefit each other. We can help the Philippine patients and also help American patients. So these were the first pair, and they became part of a, of a chain in American uh, kidney exchange. The, they are the first pair. So, the, so, so uh, Jose received a kidney from an American non-directed donor who had blood type A, and he received, he's the first one, he received the A kidney. His wife, who had blood type O, was then able to continue what became a long chain, and each pair received a kidney and gave a kidney. And so, you know, great benefits for all parties were, were achieved. And we would like to be able to expand this now. So far, we are just doing this in a trial way. We've, we've only done four pairs so far because uh, we have to also design the, the financial flows, make sure that the the big savings that happen are available to pay for the new costs, which are surgical transplants. But the reason it works is, as I said, uh, transplantation is much cheaper than dialysis. Uh, it's about as expensive in the first year, and then every year thereafter, it's vastly cheaper. And it's also a cure, much more of a cure. The, the people who receive kidneys can go back to work. They can live fruitful lives. They can pay taxes. I've been talking to you about matching markets. Kidney exchange is a matching market. It's a market where you can't buy a kidney. Prices aren't what matters. You can't just choose a kidney. You have to, you have to be matched to it. So, so some of the most important markets in the world are not commodity markets. You know, who we marry, where we go to school, what jobs we have. These are markets that are not determined by price alone. Uh, sometimes we don't let prices play an explicit role at all. Uh, so, so I mentioned these to you, but there are many more matching markets that don't work as well as they should. You know, it's a lot easier to organize a commodity market than a matching market. So if you think about a matching market that is not working well, I think refugee and migrant resettlement is a, is a good example. Uh, right now, there are many refugees in the world, and we are having trouble matching them to host countries, right? We all are parties to a, a UN convention which says that refugees have a right to, to move to a safe place, but we have trouble welcoming them 
in, as, as warmly as we would like. And so there are many refugees who, who have trouble finding a place. It's a matching market. You can't just choose where to go. You also have to be admitted. And probably we are doing it wrong. You know, probably our current thoughts about matching refugees are not uh, the right ones because we often think of refugees as just individuals. But, um, but of course, you can't just send refugees where, where you want them to go. Refugees are exactly the people who were somewhere they didn't want to be and they moved. So, so you have to think what makes refugee, what makes immigrant communities successful? And in the United States, we, we have a lot of experience with immigrants. And one of the examples I like to use is uh, people who immigrate to the, to the United States from Somalia. It turns out our immigration aid societies, uh, our refugee re resettlement organizations, initially thought that we should settle refugees uniformly across the United States, that we should, that, that way none of them would be very noticeable and they would easily be assimilated into the country. But when you look at where they are, you find that often they like to form communities with other people who speak the language and already have been here for a while. So you find Somali Americans concentrated in the state of Maine. Now the state of Maine is in the northeast of the United States and it's very cold and mostly it's losing populations. Americans are not so happy to live in Maine. It gets dark in the winter and, and there's a lot of snow. So it's not like Somalia at all. The Somalis don't go to Maine because they like to ski. They, they go to Maine because there are other Somalis there and, and there are people who can give them jobs and, and help them become Americans. And in the same way, um, you know, Emily and I now live in uh, California. And in California, if you speak Spanish but no English, if you speak Mandarin but no English, you might be able to find a job even before you learn English. Uh, you know, if you're a carpenter, you can find a contractor who will speak to you in Mandarin and speak to the customer in English. Uh, so, so in terms of integrating refugees into the economy, it sometimes will help to think of them as communities and how we should select who to admit and how we should try to help them resettle might not be so much as individuals, but as communities. So I think this is going to be a big deal. I think that in our children's and grandchildren's time, there will be more refugees, particularly if the sea level rises, then there will be many people who have to move from where they are to somewhere else. And we had better start to gain experience in how to, how to remove the congestion from this market so that, it, so that it works better. Thank you. Gracias, profesor Roth, por sus esclarecedoras investigaciones. Gracias también por exponerlas ante nuestra Real Corporación con toda brillantez y plenitud científica. Pero sobre todo, gracias, profesor, porque su trabajo ha salvado, salva y continuará salvando vidas. Y gracias también porque al escucharle ahora quienes también hemos investigado en este campo humildemente, nos podemos sentir beneficiarios de sus logros. Porque en ningún sitio como aquí, en Barcelona, podemos apreciar sus investigaciones. Se encuentra usted en la capital mundial pionera en la organización de redes de donación de trasplantes. Y también porque fueron científicos catalanes los doctores Gil Barnett y Caralps del Hospital Clínico de Barcelona, quienes en 1965 coronaron con éxito el primer trasplante de, de riñón en España. Más tarde, en junio del 76, fue el profesor Cyril Rothman con su equipo también del Hospital Clínico quien realizó el primer trasplante hologénico de médula ósea en España. Esta ciudad que acoge a la Real Academia de Ciencias Económicas y Financieras protagonizó la primera red logística europea y mundial de trasplantes de órganos. Y los catalanes y resto de españoles no lo hemos hecho nada mal. 
podemos proclamar con orgullo que nuestro país ha sido elegido durante 24 años consecutivos líder mundial en el número de trasplantes de órganos coronados con éxito. Pero estos logros no solo son patrimonio de los científicos que sí, o de nuestra buena praxis clínica que también, sino de la sociedad entera, de todos nosotros. Conscientes de que nuestro sistema de trasplantes está realizando una magnífica labor, los españoles nos hemos volcado en la donación. Y no solo los nacidos en España, también los inmigrantes en nuestro país. También ellos baten con amplitud la tasa de donaciones que se realizan, y lo hemos visto, por ejemplo, en Alemania. ¿Por qué nuestros inmigrantes donan sus órganos con generosidad más que en ningún otro país del mundo? Pues porque saben que muchos han recibido ya ese trasplante y que si alguien, alguno de ellos o sus familiares son quienes lo necesitan, será, serán tratados con justicia y equidad y podrán también ser receptores.